Good afternoon, everyone. All right. We are going to go through the second chapter of this book, the third angel's message in verity. And we are looking at the place of the law. The place of the law. I want you to follow carefully because this was a serious emphasis as well in the 1888 message that the Lord sent. And it was a balanced emphasis. We have already established a number of principles, but we are going to delve into this and reinforce what we have already said. So I invite you to kneel with me now as we ask God's blessing in prayer at this time. Let us pray. Our dear God and Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Give us the guidance and the teaching and the understanding of the mind of your spirit on these issues relative to your most precious message, which was designed to cure your people of lukewarm condition. So bless and heal and guide and direct, even in this session, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. The reason why I'm including this and uh, emphasizing this aspect is because there are some people who have an unbalanced view of the law in relation to the righteousness of Christ. We have already seen that the 1888 message, according to the servant of the Lord at that time, is described as the law and the gospel binding up the two in a perfect whole. We've also heard that the law and the gospel blended will convict the sin of sin and in no discourse are they to be divorced and that the one is the complement of the other. 1888 materials, 892. The one is the complement of the other. The righteousness of Christ in relation to the law or the righteousness of Christ in connection with the law, both together, blended together, will have its effect. So let's look at the place of the law. Are you ready? The law, first with a quotation from 1888 Materials, 159. The law we lie at the foot of the cross the more clear will be our view of Christ. For just as soon as we begin to lift ourselves up and to think that we are something, the view of Christ does what? Grow dimmer and dimmer and Satan steps in so that we cannot see him at all. But what we want is to come and dwell in view of the cross. Wonderful statement. All right. Are you familiar with the statement too in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 24? Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to do what? To bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. All of us here went to school. So we know what the role of a schoolmaster is, right? Even though in some cases it was perverted. Extreme punishment in some cases. And some of those days are gone. And they are trying to reach the days of abolishing uh, punishment within schools at a certain level. But the truth is, there's a place for the law. We may not appreciate it, but the law has its place. Whether it be in schools, or in government, or in churches, the law has its place. Notice it says schools, governments, or churches. The law has its place. Now, there's something known as an unspoken law. You ever heard about that? Unspoken laws. They are usually based on expectations. 
There are certain things that you expect people to do. You don't have, you should have to tell them. They expect, they are part of the protocol. You expect certain things. Those are the unspoken laws. But then there are certain laws that are spoken. When people don't, are not aware of them. Now tell me, in heaven, was there such a thing known as law? We are told the angels were not aware that there was such a thing called a law. But they obeyed it how? Naturally and spontaneously. And also in Psalm 103, verse 21 and 22, the Bible says, Blessed angels which obey his commandments. So the angels were obeying God's commandments naturally and spontaneously because they didn't need to know that there was a law. It did not apply to them who only was only applicable for those who, according to our understanding, break the law. The law was not made for the righteous man, but for the transgressor. It is like we say, we go into a room and we see a sign that says no smoking. Does that sign apply to you? No. You obey that sign naturally if you are not a smoker. But for a man who is a smoker and he goes in and sees that sign, what does he have to do? Struggle to obey that sign. And that is what Paul means in 1 Timothy. But let's move on. The law reveals sin to us and causes us to feel our need of Christ and to flee unto him for pardon and peace by, ex by exercising repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Very important. So we said that the law is a mirror. The law is a mirror. When you go before the mirror, what, do, what are you hoping to achieve? To see yourself physically as you are. When you go before God's law, what do you go to see? To see your true condition as you are. So what does the law do? It points out sin. It tells you how nasty you are. It tells you that you are deprived of the righteousness of Christ. And then it points you to where you can get that righteousness from. And then the, right, the law, same law tells you, when you are finished, same Christ will send you back to me to verify that you have the genuine article that you couldn't work up, but that you received as a gift. And the same law that pronounced you, condemned you, is the same law that eventually tells you you are acquitted. The same law. The same law. So when we go before the spiritual mirror, you know, I'm convinced that if many people would go every morning before the spiritual mirror of God's law, they will see how they are dressed and therefore they will not dress in certain ways. Am I right? I hear that. Yeah. If only some people will see how they are dressed before the spiritual mirror of God's law, they would not come dressed the way they do. Because they're before God's mirror, and it will show them their true dress, condition. So what is it that's lacking? The knowledge of the law. But that same law is called the law of love. It is called the royal law of liberty. The same law. It's also a law of peace. It's a law of justification as well. All right. Now, that was the heart, the bright balance between the righteousness of Christ and the law was at the heart of the 1880 message. Notice I said, the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law, right balance. Now, we have the Pentecostals on one side. We are saved by grace alone, true faith in Christ. And Adventists, on the other hand, given that legalistic trust or stance, they have to keep the law and the commandments. Dress right, eat right. So there's an unbalance there. And we are told that they preached the law till it was as dry as the hills of Gilboa without dew or rain. But the 1888 message came with the right balance. Now, if you don't have a right balance in your ear, you know your ear is dependent upon a number of things. Your ear de helps to de determine your balance as well. You know that. And if you don't have that right balance, what's going to happen? You're going to be stumbling. So you need a right balance. You can't throw away a law 
And you can't throw away the grace of Christ trying to hold on to law. You must hold both in the right balance. But the servant of the Lord said, they must be held like the coin that has two sides. Law and grace. But we are told in selected messages, but one, page two, three, four, an unwillingness to accept this truth of the right balance lay at the foundation to a lar of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through brethren E.J. Wagoner and A.T. Jones. They are accustomed to preaching that the law is not abolished and that you have to keep the commandments. And here are two stalwarts, Jones and Wagoner, coming and saying that the law that was the schoolmaster in Jesus Christ includes not just the ceremonial law, but especially the moral law. So they saw them as a threat. And they wrote articles that counseled counsel them. So while Wagner and Jones were writing in the Review and Herald articles, Butler and Smith invented something called the Gospel Sickle. And Ella White said every time she took up the Gospel Sickle, it makes her heart sick. So that was the opposition. The Bible says in Romans 7, 12, the law is holy and just and good. The law of God is not anything to be afraid of. You know who's afraid of the law? Who? Lawbreakers. Lawbreakers are afraid of the law. But the law is not anything to be afraid of. There were some fellows gambling in the area where I used to live. And a police van came around the corner. They didn't reach them yet. And somebody spread the word. What happened? They scampered like rat, rats or mice. And left all the money and everything. All the cards, the money, everything. And, all the, and the person that got out first was a small policeman. The person that got out first out of the van was the smallest policeman. So the law, well, the law has its place. But the law is not, not anything to be afraid of. And it has its place in the righteousness of Christ. It was an emphasis of the 1888 message, the third angel's message in verity. That's what the servant of the Lord said. But the law is not our savior. Let's get it right. The law is not our savior. You know, some people don't agree with this. The law is not our savior. Not faith. Faith is not our savior either. Not good works. Not missionary work. I don't care how much missionary work a person does. That cannot save them. Even if it is preaching. You know what the spread of prophecy said? Preaching calls for the least self-sacrifice. So we can't glorify preaching to the point where we feel that it's going to contribute to our salvation. Not good works. Not missionary work. Not prayer. Nor fasting. Nor even praising God. Even spirit-inspired or spirit-motivated works cannot save us. No wonder Paul says, if I had the gift of being able to work miracles and could command this mountain to move from here to yonder and can do great works of charity and even give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me how much? Nothing. You know, years ago, attending the Light Bears Camp meeting, 1989, we had two speakers that were contradicting one another. We had Ty Gibson on one side, and we had Marvin Moore on the other side. Marvin Moore was using his Alcoholics Anonymous formula or program. And Ty Gibson was presented the righteousness of Christ. Righteous by faith method message. And it was clearly evident which one was true from which one was false. That was that camp meeting. I was young then. But, so even our spirit inspired, whether it be miracles, charity, preaching, teaching, singing, whatever it is, even our spirit motivated or spirit inspired works 
cannot save us. What only can save us? Only the merits of Christ can save us. God sees only the righteousness of Christ as our title and our fitness for heaven. And we need both. We need the title. We will come to that later on. We need both the title and the fitness as well. Pentecostals emphasize the title, but they do not stress on the fitness. For them, which is an imbalance again, everything was accomplished at the cross. What happened at the cross? Just the sacrifice. The sacrifice was perfect. The sacrifice was complete. It was an atonement, but it was not final. The, the atonement was not final, that is. Christ was still to go into the, most, into the holy place first and do a work there, and then into the most holy to complete that work. And those are the areas that are not emphasized because they involve sanctification, character development, perfection, and the preparation of a people to stand in the presence of God. So they have half a gospel. Pentecostals and other Protestants have half of the gospel. Obedience to the law cannot save us. As important as that is, obedience to the law cannot save us. Health reform. And you know, we put a lot of emphasis on health reform to the point where we believe that some are more saved than others because of their practice. Or that some are more spiritual than others because of our practice. You know, we believe that. But what makes a person spiritual and committed is his consecration and commitment to God, not what we practice. So health reform, dress reform, Sabbath reform, and Sabbath keeping cannot save us. We have to preach them, uh, but Christ must be central in them all. And while in, while in 1888 the law was preached until it was as dry as the hills of Gilboa, without Jew or rain, that is, without Christ or the Holy Spirit, the law still has its place in the gospel of Christ. So we have the challenge in the religious world where people are saying, we are not under the law, but under grace. Is that true? Is that statement true? That statement is true. But who is it referring to? When the Bible says we are not under the law, but under grace, you have to look at the text in its context. Remember that. We have to look at the text in its context. We are not under the law, but under grace. That is talking to a man who is a transgressor of the law. A man who is under the law is a transgressor. A man who is not under the law is under grace. That's the difference there between the two. And many of those who preach this does not, do not understand the Pentecostals and others who preach about this. We are not under the law, we are under grace. We are not under the old covenant, we are under the new. And by old covenant, they mean the law. You need to understand that. that when the Pentecostals and others said, we ain't under the law, we under grace, they mean old covenant. The law represents old covenant. When the law is the, was the basis for both the old covenant and the new covenant. And that old covenant and new covenant had nothing to do with dispensation. Because a man can have the new covenant experience in the Old Testament, and a man can have the old covenant experience even in the New Testament era. They are, non, they are not dispensational, as it were. And then this language, Christ is the end of the law. You ever heard of Pentecost say that? Christ is the end of the law. Is that true? Again, taking a text out of context. The Bible says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Christ is the end of the struggle to get righteousness by law keeping. That is what that text really means. So people take text out of context. And then they like to quote things like Romans 14. You're familiar with that? Romans 14 says, One man esteemeth a day, and another man esteemeth another day. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. But listen to this. That text is taken out of its context. Because in the context, Paul is not addressing any Sunday Sabbath controversy. 
because the Sunday Sabbath controversy was not an issue in Paul's day. You agree with that? It was not an issue in Paul's day. It was not applicable in Paul's day. So Paul was not addressing that. But yet people like to quote it. Again, a text taken out of context. And then they quote Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect and holy day of the new moon or Sabbath, which are a sign of things to come. The context is judging. But we can go down that line another time. But context is judging. So we always have to take text within their context. If you are preaching a normal sermon and you want to use license to apply it spiritually in a certain context, you can take a text and blow it up and apply it in that area. Application wise. So, you know, since then, many churches have preached grace or Christ without any relation to the law. Some have gone so far as to preach that the law is abolished and that we are not under the law. Now, why am I stressing this? Because yesterday I mentioned about the Elijah message and reformation. And you know, as well as I, that the message of Elijah was supposed to be our message of restoration. And what was it supposed to do? It was to put back in the law in its rightful place. Actually, the text that says in Isaiah 58, that they that shall be of thee shall build the old ways places. They shall raise up the foundation of many generations, and they shall be called the restorer of the breach, the restorer of path, the builder of the breach, or the restorer of paths to dwell in. So the Elijah message was a message of restoration, a message of building up, and putting the Sabbath and the law in their rightful perspective. So even before you read Malachi 4, 5, 5 and 6, verse, the previous verse 4, talks about the law and the commandments of God. Even before it comes to the aspect of restoration. Putting in the hearts, the understanding of the children, that faith of their forefathers. That's what the context really says. Putting in the heart and in the understanding of the children, the faith of their forefathers. That's what it's really dealing with. So, Far from abolishing the Ten Commandments or the law, God wants to write it in our hearts and in our minds. And that is Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16. Hebrews 10, 16. Now that's not the only thing that was abolished. You heard this morning, there's a text in Timothy that says, Christ have abolished death and brought immortality and light through the gospel. What death was it that Christ abolished? That was the question this morning. Now, when Adam sinned, he separated humanity from God. What death did Adam die that day? God had said, in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. What death did Adam die when he ate of the of forbidden fruit? Pardon? Spiritual death. And then was dying physical death. He died spiritual death, separation from God, and then he was dying physical death. And he would have died eternally, out, blotted out of non-existence, if Christ had not interposed. That is when Bible Commentary, Volume 5, 10 to 85, we are told that instant that man sinned, and did the very thing God told him not to do. Christ stepped between the living and the dead and said, let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. He shall have another chance. A substitutionary death. That is the death that, we, that was ours due to separation from God. Christ abolished that. Now, you follow me? Christ abolished that death. Now, 
He experienced separation from God. And for three days, as a person, he did not function. He was dead. Now, when you are dead, do you exist anymore? Huh? So would it be correct to say that when Christ was in the grave for the three days, that he went into non-existence? Would it be correct to say that? He was dead. As the son of God, no divinity can die, but as a person, he died. Did he exist? Was he still alive? Was he in existence? All right, I guess that's for later discussion too. But the death that we die physically and the sins that we commit are the direct result of separation from God because of Adam's sin. So because of Adam's sin, the Bible says that many, which is all, were made sinners. And that is why we sin. We sin because we are sinners. Our sinning does not make us sinners. It is because we are sinners that we sin. So all sin that comes as a result of separation from Adam can be forgiven of men. All sin and blasphemy, Jesus said, that are committed can be forgiven of men. But this one called the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, will not be forgiven in this life nor in the life to come. So God doesn't hold it to our account when, well, in terms of eternal death, when we sin as a result of being made sinners, as a result of separation caused because of Adam's sin. But when we add our sin to that sin, that is where we incriminate ourselves and jeopardize our eternal salvation. It's very important to understand these principles. Let's move on. So far from abolishing God's law, he wants to write it in our hearts and in our minds. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 16. The law is often seen as a threat to the gospel and the righteousness of Christ. Any mention of the law is considered legalism. But Christ said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophet. I came not to destroy but to... Now ask me this question. Did Christ keep the law? Yeah? Was he a legalist? So there's a way of keeping a law that does not make you a legalist. Yeah? The prophet Isaiah said that Christ would magnify the law and make it honorable. Isaiah 42, verse 21. The apostle Paul said that the very righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us when we are in Christ, walking after the spirit and not after the flesh. Very important to understand these principles. Then there's another point here that says the law of God is the law of love. Now if only we can have that law written in our minds and in our hearts. The Bible puts it like this. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. So when that mind is in us that was in Christ, we will obey the law how? Naturally and spontaneously. Nobody had to tell us to keep the law. The very righteousness of Christ will fulfill that law in and through us. And that includes having the honest, genuine heart, surrender, and obedience to God. But there are some people who come to church who don't know about that experience. They don't know about that experience. And we put things in place in order for them to conform. And that has its place because everybody in the church is not converted. But it cannot justify them nor save them in the eyes of God. Some people call it rules and regulation. There are rules in my house. Should my wife obey my rules? Yeah? I hear you there. But you hear rules the wrong way, right? There are rules in my house. There are rules at work. Should she obey the boss in those rules at work? Yeah? Then she goes to work that she have to obey her superiors. Are there rules at work that she have to obey? 
So what's wrong with obeying my rules? Should she have more respect for her boss than for me? Yeah? She submits to her boss. Why can't she submit to me as well? Y'all see what I'm saying? I am saying that there are some women who are more submissive to their boss and to other people than they are to their husbands or their wives at home. And the Bible talks about submitting yourself to each other. But we would rather do that with somebody else who's outside of us than somebody right within our homes that we should highly respect, reverence, yes, reverence, respect, according to the Apostle Paul, and submit to. In love, we submit to the person in obedience because we don't want to get fired from the job. But the, apart, the Bible talks about the law of love and submitting to the law of love. That's all it is. It's not hard. Our stubborn will makes it hard. So the Apostle Paul said that the very righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. And the law of love, the law of God is the law of love. It is the law of self-sacrificing love for earth and heaven. And then we have this statement. The Christ is the very embodiment of the law of God. So when you have that Bible commentary, volume 5, 1131. So if you have that, you have the law as well. The law was, is a transcript of the very character of God. It is as sacred as God himself. It was because the law could not be changed or broken that Christ came to die for us. In doing so, he satisfied the just demands of the law and exhausted its penalty. So if ever anybody dies, it will not be because of Adam's sins, which came because of Adam's sin which separated us from God and made us sinners. They will not die for any one of those, but for rejecting of God's offer of salvation in them from sin and from sinning. Christ came to demonstrate what the broken law does to the heart. You hear what you said? Christ came to demonstrate what the broken law does to the heart. Now, all of us here know that the law does not discriminate. Am I right? Law does not discriminate. And this morning, very early, I got a call, and I had to go to the police station to assist a brother who was incriminated by the law. Let me give you the picture. And the law doesn't discriminate, but hear, hear the story. The brother told me when I went and I signed on his behalf, have him released. He said, for walking across a path, I saw no sign saying no trespassing. I was never told of it before. I am accustomed to seeing people passing through there. And for passing through that sign, the gentleman called the police and told the police that I was trespassing on his property. Now, does the law consider anything like that? I said, did you ever have any conflict with the person? Any quarrel? He said, nothing like that. I said, you don't remember any? He said, just one. And that was a case when he was beating, the, the neighbor was beating his son with a piece of wire. And I told him, why don't you stand? And the gentleman and the son, the man's, the neighbor's son, cried out to him for help. And he told the man, why don't you stop beating him like that? He said, it's none of your business. He said, no, it concerns me. He can't for my help. And he went and he took the wire away, stopped the man from beating his son, took the wire away from him. That was all. He said he never had any quarrel with him, but apparently there was a bias against him. So this time around, crossing that trespass, trespassing his property, the man called. And you know when the police hear somebody trespassing your property, they come equipped. They come equipped. He said eight big policemen showed up and took him down to the station. So when I started to question the others, I, first I met my cousin who was one of the sergeants there, and then I questioned the other one, and he said, there's something between him and the neighbor, and he said the neighbor doesn't like him, and he reported him for trespassing. Now tell me, do you think the law has feelings and is subjective? Do you think the law is going to say, we understand the situation? Now it takes a human being to be subjective, but not the law. The law requires what? 
For transgressing the law, what does the law require? Death. But Christ came in to satisfy the penalty of the law and exhausted the penalty of what the law required but could not give. Christ satisfied the full effects of the broken law. The broken law demands death. In the great controversy, the broken law demanded the death of the sinner. Let's read about it and see what that broken law does to the heart of God. Education, page 263. Listen to it. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony, but that suffering did not begin or end with his manifestation in humanity. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its very inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. Every departure from right, now underline that, every departure from right, not, not some, not most, every departure from right, every deed of cruelty. And the interesting thing is the neighbor is a very, very sick man and has to go to the hospital every day. He should have had mercy and not sacrifice. Every departure from the right, every deed of cruelty, every failure of humanity to reach his ideal brings grief to him. Yet God feels it all. In order to destroy sin and its result, he gave his best beloved and he has put it in our power. Underline that phrase as well. He has put it in our power to do what? Through cooperation with him to bring this scene of misery to an end. I like that quote. The law demands righteousness, but it cannot give it. Instead, it points us to Christ, the source of righteousness. And when we have it, the same law will attest that we have the genuine article. Here, Wagner, in the book, Gospel in Galatians. Wagner, page 37, Wagner says, it is the law which arrests the criminal. The policeman is simply the visible agent of the law. It is the law which locks the prisoner in his cell. The jailer, the iron walls, the heavy bars which surround the prisoner are simply the emblem of the iron hand of the law which is upon him. So it is with the sinner against God's government. The eyes of the law are in every place so that there is no possibility that he can escape arrest. As soon as he has sinned, he is seized by the law and is at once under condemnation of death. The Spirit of God causes the prison walls to close in upon him. His cell becomes narrower and narrower and he feels oppressed. And then he makes desperate struggles to escape because he has violated every one of the Ten Commandments. Now how do we do that? The Bible says that if we wear it one, we are guilty of all. He is completely shut in on every side. There is, however, but, but just one avenue of escape, and that is through Christ. Christ is the door, and entrance through that door gives freedom. Praise the Lord. Entrance through that door gives freedom. Signs of the Times, Wagon again in Signs of the Times, August 26, 1886 says, Stung by his awakened conscience, the guilty one seeks peace and rest, but the law relentlessly charges him with his sin. All that it will do is deepen conviction and thus add to the load that weighs down the sinner. Finally, when he loses confidence in himself, and cries out, O oh, wretched man that I am, he is forced to cast himself at the feet of Jesus, saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. This is the only avenue of escape, and it is the one that never fails. Thus the law literally drives the sinner to Christ by shutting up every other way of freedom from guilt. So when a person does wrong, they're supposed to feel guilty. You're supposed to feel remorse. Anytime a person doesn't feel guilty or doesn't feel remorse, it means they have not felt or sensed 
the magnitude of their wrongdoing. So if a young man commits fornication and gets a girl pregnant who has yielded to that sin, so it works like that, unless it is rape. So we can't blame one and not the other. Guilty. Both are guilty in God's eyes. They must feel guilt and remorse. And if the person is a preacher and their person says to the congregation, I'm giving you time to get over this. That is out of place. That person does no longer hold the call. Does not, that call is not that person's own. The person has to respect the authority of the church. Or a choir member or whoever. It does not matter. The church has authority. Otherwise, everything is going to be chaotic and left to people's personal whims and fancies and impressions and ideas. And a church cannot be run like that. School doesn't run like that, nor a church. Neither should the home. Let's move on. The first step towards reconciliation, personal reconciliation to God, is the conviction of sin. 1 John 3, 4 says what? Sin is the whosoever, trans, whosoever committed sin, transgressive, also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And by the Bible says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Well, I'm going to continue. He says, to slay the sinner is then the first use of the law. To destroy the life and strength wherein he trusts. And convince him that he is dead while he liveth. Not only under the sentence of death, but actually dead unto God. Void of all spiritual life. Dead in trespasses and sin. The second use of the law is to bring him to, unto life, unto Christ, that he may live. And even if the man exercises faith, we are told that faith is just the medium through which truth or error finds a lodging place in the mind. Well, I'm going to continue. He says, it is true in performing both these offices, it acts the part of a severe schoolmaster. It drives by force rather than draws us by love. And yet love is the spring of it all. Now, we have in Barbados people pushing for the abolition of corporal punishment in schools. Not only in schools, but also in the home. They're pushing for that. Now, for people who have been brought up in a certain culture, knowing that they cannot have their own way and feeling that they can have their own way still, and rebelling, there's no, and you tell them that there's no recourse, the parents have no authority to discipline you or to put a check upon you, it is going to cause tremendous chaos in schools. You know what children would say? Especially bigger ones, I ain't care, nobody can't hit me. The minister say, I, I can't get, you can't hit me. And then when they say we call their parents, and then problem my parents ain't going to do me nothing. So we have to use the method of what we call time out. And time out sometimes only causes more problems. So the, the principals are left to resort to sending, sending them home suspension for 10 days, or 5 or 10 days. And then they come back with the same disposition, having understood no consequences of their wrongdoing and feeling no remorse or guilt for what they have done wrong. And then they do it again. If they, and if they want to stay home with their friends, if they want to stay home with their friends in the neighborhood and gamble or show drugs, what will they do when they come back? Repeat the same episode. And that's happened over and over again. But when parents are with us in terms of coming down on wrongdoing and they are cooperating and liaising just to hear I call it remote control. For the parents at home, the child at school, for the child to hear that the parents will be informed and have to come down, that itself is a form of control. And we can't get obedience motivated by love, but what we can get is compliance at school. Because you have a whole set of children, and if one of them choose to rebel, to follow their own way, and follow their own government, 
and their own choices and their own activities, regardless of what all the rest of the authorities and the schools say, what is that going to create in the school? Chaos. And it's going to lead to rebellion by some of the others in school. You ain't do nothing to him, so why should you want to do it to me? It is going to create confusion. And that is why there is a place for rules and unspoken expectations as well. Let's move on. So it is true that in reform, performing both these offices, it acts the part of a severe schoolmaster. It drives by force rather than draws us by love. And yet love is the spring of it all. It is the spirit of love which by this painful means tears away any confidence in the flesh which leaves us no broken reed whereon to trust and so constrains the sinner, stripped of all, to cry out in bitterness of his soul. Wagoner, Signs of the Times, September 2, 1886. What does the spread of prophecy says about the nature of this intervention? 1888 material, 781. The nature of the intervention should ever make man afraid to do the smallest action in disobedience to God's requirements. There should be a clear understanding of that which constitutes sin. And we should avoid the least approach. Listen to this. We should avoid the least approach to step over the boundaries from obedience to disobedience. It continues here. Let's see, let's message but one, two, three, four. Or 1888 material, 781 says, there is a necessity of dwelling upon the love of Jesus Christ. Is that important? It is important. There's a necessity of dwelling upon the love of Jesus. This is essential, but it is not all that must be spoken. The great standard of character, God's holy law, with all its solemn injunction, should be distinctly set forth together with the circumstances of the giving of the law from Mount Sinai in awful grandeur. Christ, Christ triumphant, page 81. That is called a goody-goody religion. This goody-goody religion that makes light of sin and that is forever dwelling upon the love of God to the sinner, encourages sinners to believe that God will save them while they continue in sin and know it to be sin. This is the way that many are doing who profess to believe present truth. What a statement. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7 clearly understood the role of the law in the salvation of man. First, he stated that I would not have known sin except through the law. And then he said, I was alive without the law once. Nothing convicted my mind, no feelings of guilt. I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. The law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Soul under sin. What do you call a man that is soul under sin? A man that is soul, a slave. So you know, up to now, even the Adventist world and the Pentecostals do not have a correct theology on Romans chapter 7. A gentleman up there, and a young man at CUC, a couple years ago, read this and struggled. People told him it was the Christian experience. He struggled. He couldn't get out of the situation. Then they found him dead under blankets, suffocating himself. And that passage was the last one he was reading. Romans chapter 7. He felt hopeless in this Christian experience. The things that he would like to do, he couldn't do. The things that he hated doing, he couldn't do it, get done. And he did not see it as a man still in bondage. But they told him that it was a Christian experience. So he figured that there was no hope. That is why when people come to my home to witness, I ask them, what hope do you offer me in this world and in the world to come? The watchtower come and they don't offer you none. Because the watchtower says, you are not going to go to heaven. The watchtower tells you so early. You're not going to heaven. Only the other prophet tells you to go to heaven, and they're all Jehovah's Witnesses. So I said, what hope is there for me then? I said, secondly, I can't go to heaven. Only watch them. So I got to become a watch them. The other one, can I get the victory over sin in this life? Well, not really. We can't overcome sin in this life. We can sin right up until the end of the age. So no hope in this life, and no hope for the future life. So I tell them, sorry, I can't accept your religion. Your religion offers me no hope. Well, if that is your feeling, well. Anyway, let's close up. The Apostle Paul, in relating his experience 
presents an important truth concerning the work to be wrought in conversion. He says, I was alive without the law one. He felt, listen to the spirit of prophecy, he felt no condemnation. But when the commandment came, when the law of God was urged upon his conscience, sin revived and I died. Then he saw himself a sinner condemned by the divine law. Mark it. Mark. It was Paul and not the law that day. Sin then appeared in its true hideousness and his self-esteem was gone. He became humble. He no longer ascribed goodness and merit to himself. He ceased to think more highly of himself than he ought and he ascribed all the glory to God. He was no longer ambitious for greatness. He ceased to want to avenge himself and was no longer sensitive to reproach, neglect, or contempt. He no longer saw earthly alliance, station, or honor. He did not pull down others to lift, uplift himself. Now some people do that. They believe the way to get to the top is stepping on the heads of others, pushing them down. He did not pull down others to uplift himself. He became gentle, condescending, meek, and lowly of heart because he had learned his lesson in the school of Christ. He talked of Jesus and his matchless love and grew more and more into his image. He bent his whole energy to win souls to Christ. When the spiritual character of the law was discerned, he saw himself a sinner. When he looked into the depths of his holy precept and saw himself as God saw him, he bowed in humiliation and confessed his guilt. When he saw the spiritual nature of the law, sin appeared in its true hideousness and his self-esteem was gone. This holy revelation led Paul to cry out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Then he found the answer and proclaimed joyfully, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul found the answer. May we too see the spiritual nature of the law in the gospel and experience deliverance from the bondage of sin. All right, I just have about a minute or so. Any questions that anyone has? Any questions? May not pretend to be able to guess. May not be able to pretend to answer all, but we can have it for discussion as well. Quickly. Where's the mic? You're going to need the mic for me. Page 22. Yeah. Right. But the law is not our savior. Right. That it is um, not faith, not good works, not missionary work, nor prayer, fasting, or even praising right. the Creator. But here, um, the scripture where it says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and the law is the truth. And then there is another scripture where it says, The law is perfect, converting the soul. Yeah. And then the Messiah himself said, he is the truth. So we see a, a relationship between the law and the Messiah. Yeah. Now, to understand this, we have to go back up on the mount with Moses and see what did he really receive up on the mount. Because, you know, a lot of people, you know, what has been given to us and what has been shown in the movies and everything is like Moses just came down with the Ten Commandments. But if we go back to Exodus 24:12 and re-examine what did Moses really receive up on that mount. Exodus 24, 12 says, Moses, come up to me on the mount and be there, and I will give you tables of stone, which is the Ten Commandments, and the law and commandments. So clearly we see Moses got three things up on the mount, right? We have the Ten Commandments, 
you have this law. When you re-examine and you look at the word law, law is really the seed. This is the seed of the covenant. It is the seed of life eternal. It is the seed because only in a seed could life be effected. Right? No seed, no life, no righteousness. Just as Yahushua preached, he said, the kingdom of heaven is as a man plants seed. Um, Isaiah says, to the law and to the witness of the Messiah, if you speak not according to this word, there is no light in you. So this law, you have to re-examine and see what this law is about. You see what happened when they rewrote these scriptures? They removed the word Torah or seed of the covenant and they replaced it with the word law. But when you read the word law, most people just think only of the Ten Commandments or they think of the law in type. They do not see law as a seed. Where he say, when he says, I will, plant, I will put my law into your heart and write it upon your mind, he is literally planting his seed. We, we are going on to a harvest. And this harvest started at the Garden of Eden. And this harvest will continue until at the end of the world. So this is this seed that is planted in our heart, this law, this living law, this living Torah, right? That is the seed of the covenant to bring us into covenant relationship with the Most High. And uh, when, when the Messiah came, he came to fulfill that seed because every person who would make it in the Old Testament, they had that seed planted in them. They had that seed of life. They didn't just only follow the type. They ha to have a type of something, you must have the real. So the they also had the real even in the time when the type existed. Mm -hmm. But Yahushua Mashiach, he came to fulfill that type. He was this seed encapsulated that the people, when they, when they, when they heard this truth and they accepted it, that they had life eternal abiding in them. Mm -hmm. Right? So he came to fulfill that. He came to fulfill this seed which had a particular formula. And this formula is, is all about righteousness because only in life is righteousness, right? This formula, it has seven um, segments of its righteousness. Every seed has a formula, mango seed, pomerac seed, whatever. So this formula that is given to us in this seed that is planted in our heart, it is the seed of life. It is first the mystery of all mysteries, right? Father Yahuwah and his son in this sinful flesh. Second, because all that Adam lost when he sinned, it had to be given back to him in order to reinstate him back into the creator's um, um, instead, right? So he had the mystery of all mysteries, right? Even the men of old, they had that mystery of all mystery in them. This law, this seed in them, right? Then they, had, then they had to love righteousness and hate iniquity. And the Messiah came and he walked this earth, and he fulfilled every one of these. He loved righteousness for us and hated iniquity so that it could be provided for us. Then he had to have that faith, this formula of this seed. He had to have the faith, not just my ability to have faith, just to believe that this is a bench, but the faith that is given to us is a gift. It is the faith of the Messiah himself, the faith that he had when he walked this earth, that is the faith that is given to us. Not just our ability to say, I believe this or that. It is his faith that is given to us in this formula of the seed. Then he had to live a sinless life. He had to obey every single commandment. So everything that was lost was given to him. So he had to, let me wrap it up. So, so he lived this sinless life, right? And that is what was provided for us because we lost it when Adam sinned. Okay. Then he had to have that spiritual justice in character. We to, the, the, this character that is given to us is in this formula. And this character that is given to us, we have to praise the Father and Son okay. for it. It's nothing about us. We got to the vessel right now. We can right. talk later on. Right. Anyhow, um, well, thank God for your contribution. Let us pray. God and Father, we thank you for what has been shared so far. We pray that we may truly understand the right relation of the law to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Teach us continually by your spirit and implant the seed or the mind of Christ in us that will fulfill the law through us naturally and spontaneously. 
In Jesus' name we pray.